You are tuned into This Week in Amateur Radio. For the past 23 years, we are North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1207 of This Week in Amateur Radio. Amateur Radio helps rescue an injured California outdoorsman. We'll have the story. The AWRL Expo will take place at the Dayton Hamvention coming up in a few weeks. We will have an overview. An amateur radio operator and teacher, Chris Murphy, KD2MRV, uses ham radio balloons to encourage STEM learning in Gloversville, New York. We'll tell you what he's up to. John Castello, N4BAA, is named the new CQ Magazine Worked All Zones Manager. Amateur radio operators around the planet are preparing for World Amateur Radio Day. A paper shortage hits the amateur radio magazine world as ham organizations around the planet struggle to find paper to print their magazines. A few new employment positions have opened up at the ARRL headquarters. We will tell you all about them. Finland authorizes the use of encryption on the amateur bands in limited circumstances and the Spratly Islands are getting more dangerous for hams to hold the expeditions. We'll tell you why, as all this and a lot more are straight ahead in today's edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with some of this week's special bulletins where we'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will discuss how to repurpose that old computer in your closet with free open source software, and he will discuss what we all do with our glass fondle slabs. Australia's own Anno Benshoff, VK6FLAB, will take a look at what you do after you discover the chaos and finally decide it's time to build the ideal radio shack. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOI, returns with yet another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill begins his look at some of amateur radio's fallen flags with a close-up look at the National Radio Company. Our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, takes a look at a phenomenon that tends to happen each spring in the Midwest called dead band syndrome. And... We will visit with Vance Martin, N3VEM, who has the March 2022 Parks on the Air update for us. That's all straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio here in, it was nice, but now it's a little chilly, Albany, New York, I'm George, W2XBS. And reporting from the newsroom in Half Moon, New York, I'm Terry Saunders, N1KIN. And reporting this week from the downtown neighborhood of Armory Square in Syracuse, New York, I'm Chris Perrine, KB2FAF. And reporting from the Catskill Mountains in western New York State, where the rivers are just below flood stage, but yet the bluebirds are making a nest, I'm Don Hewlett, K2ATJ. And reporting from our news bureau in Rochester, New York, Along the southern shore of Lake Ontario, I'm Dave Wilson, WA2HOY. And back in Studio One of our Central Florida News Bureau, from my travels up and down the east coast of the U.S., I'm Fred, November Fox 2 Fox. And reporting from our Troy, New York News Bureau, where spring is just getting underway, I'm Eric, KD2RJX. And reporting from our news bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where old man Winter has certainly outworn his welcome, I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR, who says enough of this cold weather. And now with this week's lead story, here is Terry Saunders, N1KIN. Leading off our news this week, a relaxing weekend of camping and fishing did not go as planned last Friday when a member of a California outdoors club fell and broke his hip. The Old Goats Mountain Club had worked their way along an old Forest Service road into a rugged off-grid location in the foothills of the Cascade Mountains. Dave Johnson, KL7DJ, said his friend slipped and fell while trying to reel in a catch. The injury was so severe that the man could not be moved safely with a trip that could take at least two hours over the rough terrain. 
Johnson is the only licensed amateur radio operator in the group, and using the California Amateur Linking Radio Association system, he was able to call for emergency help from this vehicle. Greg Stanback, KD6VEN, located in the San Francisco Bay Area, responded and contacted the Shasta County EMS, which dispatched a Reach 5 rescue helicopter from their base in Redding, California. The entire rescue took about one hour, and before the helicopter landed, a local ambulance company arrived and was able to stabilize the injured camper. After surgery and three days in the hospital, he is now at home recovering. Johnson's wife, Linda, KL7ISN, helped coordinate getting their friend's vehicle back to Redding. Using pre-planned contact schedules for Friday and Saturday, and after several makeshift auto patches, the car was driven to a nearby highway where two other club members were able to take the car safely back home. But the weekend was not over for amateur radio help. While the rest of the group was making their way out of the mountains on Sunday, they were flagged down by a stranded motorist. His car's gas tank had been punctured and his cell phone would not work. He was taken to a small community along the way where there was a landline and he was able to call for help from AAA. Johnson said the motorist was thankful for the help and another member of the Old Goats Mountain Club suggested the motorist might want to consider getting an amateur radio license. While waiting for a tow truck to arrive, Johnson and a couple of Old Goats Mountain Club members talked about amateur radio and how it had helped over the last few days. One member suggested maybe even he should have a transceiver installed in his vehicle. Johnson plans to make sure his friend and the motorist get a complete demonstration. Radio amateur Chris Murphy, Kilo Delta 2, Mike Romeo Victor, has been teaching students how to build and launch high-altitude balloons that carry an amateur radio APRS payload. APRS stands for Automatic Packet Reporting System, used for a number of telemetry purposes, including positional information. The Gloversville Leader Herald newspaper reports that a team of teachers and students at Gloversville Middle School launch weather balloons with an APRS payload attached, and then science teacher Chris Murphy is behind the wheel, ready to drive to wherever the landing site might be. In the back seat are students following the airship on computers and punching in data that helps determine the direction he needs to drive in. The school district's High Altitude Achievement Club has been going on these adventures with students since 2013, and ham radio operators along the route and someone at the home base help too. The experience varies from a convoy of cars to a single vehicle, and from students on a second or third launch to their very first. The 17th and most recent launch on March the 17th was, however, a first. It was the beginning of a launching era, including 13-year-olds, that's USA Grade 8, in the experience. Prior to launch day, the older students helped Chris Murphy with work related to piecing together the payload. The most recent one included QR code cards sent to the organization Teachers in Space, a non-profit activity focused on stimulating student interest in STEM learning by providing teachers with space experiments and industry connections from students at different schools in New York. The cards are scanned at launch and recovery. And there's a prototype of the Serenity satellite to be put into orbit by Firefly Aerospace, which contains a 30-sensor microcomputer and two cameras. Throughout the years of the club, it has been a launching point for Gloversville students to recognise passions for science, technology, engineering and mathematics careers. Murphy can easily reflect and think of former students chasing those dreams, including 2016 graduate Austin Rees, now working on his Masters at Cornell Research University. You can read the full story at leaderherald.com. The National Radio Societies of Switzerland, the USKA, in the US, the AWRL, and the DARC in Germany have all reported difficulties in getting a hold of the paper needed for their monthly magazines. In the US, the AWRL released the following to its members. As many organizations and industries have struggled with supply chain issues, AWRL has been no exception. The supply of paper has become constrained for many reasons, and despite the best efforts of our publishing partner, LSC Communications, formerly R.R. Donnelly, to mitigate those problems, getting paper for the May 2022 issue of QST was a challenge to ensure it was printed and distributed to its members and on time. While other magazines have struggled to get their print edition delivered to subscribers, we were not going to let this be an issue for our members. As a result, we went to paper brokers to get paper to ensure QST would be delivered. 
Regrettably, as you have probably seen, the paper the magazine is printed on is different paper than the readers are used to, and not what we would have liked. However, we are happy to know that members have been receiving their copies and enjoying them, despite the differences in the latest issue's paper. Please note that this is not a new direction for QST. We have not made a conscious decision to change the paper QST is printed on every month. Even though going to paper brokers is an expensive proposition, the ARRL board and staff will do what is necessary to keep the presses running for our membership journal. We are committed to ensuring that our members receive QST on a timely basis. Even before the current supply chain problems, we were facing the reality that there are, today, fewer printers, fewer paper mills, and always rising costs for paper, transportation, and mailing. This is not a short-term problem. It will require our continued close attention as we manage the print side of our organization. The good news is that ARRL committed to developing a parallel print and digital publishing competency over 10 years ago. Today, all members can access all four ARRL periodicals, QST, on the Air, NCJ, and QEX in fully searchable digital editions. These are available to you anytime and from anywhere. The ARRL, in partnership with the Dayton Hamvention, will offer free events and forums every day at 2022's Hamvention, beginning on Friday, May 20th. Here is a quick overview of this year's offerings you can attend. ARRL booths, radio clubs, take the radio club health check, ARRL Development and the ARRL Foundation, raising resources to extend the reach of ARRL programs and services beyond membership dues. ARIES, the ARRL Amateur Radio Emergency Service and featuring ARRL Ham Aid. Meet the authors. Meet ARRL authors and editors who are inspiring today's radio experimenters, operators, and innovators. And be sure to check the schedule in the ARRL exhibit area. ARRL Collegiate Amateur Radio Initiative. We want you to help advance ham radio among college and university students. Visit this webpage, www.arrl.org slash we want you. The ARRL Laboratory, where you can get your handheld radio tested. The ARRL Learning Center and ARRL Teacher Institute. Meet the ARRL Education and Technology Program Instructors and explore the resources available for introducing radio science and wireless technology to everyone. Find ways to make, discover, experiment, explore, and build. The ARRL's Great Lakes Division. Visit this gathering area for ARRL Field Organization Networking, hosted by the ARRL Great Lakes Division and features these ARRL sections, Ohio, Kentucky, and Michigan. Radio Sport and DXCC. DXCC card checking, ARRL contesting and awards, ARRL's Logbook of the World, and the QSL Bureau. ARRL VEC and ARRL Volunteer Monitoring Program. Representatives from the ARRL Volunteer Examiner Program and also the Volunteer Monitoring Program will be available to answer your questions. The International Amateur Radio Union. This is your chance to meet with representatives from the IARU. The ARRL sponsored forums will begin on Friday, May 20th, including the 2022 ARRL Field Day and the ARRL Amateur Radio Emergency Services Forums. On Friday from 9.15 to 10.20 a.m. in Conference Room 3, ARRL Field Day. Ready, set, go. Field Day, Ham Radio's most popular on-the-air event, is June 25th and 26th, 2022. Field Day is fun whether you're participating from the great outdoors with your radio club or from your home or backyard. It's all a terrific opportunity to practice your personal radio communication readiness and to demonstrate amateur radio to the public. Hear from a panel of field day experts who will cover the educational, operating, and public relations objectives of a successful and fun field day. The panel will include Bart Janke, W9JJ, ARRL Radio Sport and Regulatory Information Manager, who will cover rules and recap What's new? Bob Newman, W5OV, the ARRL's Director of Operations, who will discuss operating tips. Scott Roberts, KK4ECR, the ARRL's Public Relations Committee member, 
who will explain how to get a boost by promoting your field day activation. On Friday from 1.15 p.m. to 2.25 p.m. in Conference Room 3, the ARRL's Amateur Radio Emergency Services, or ARIES Forum. Presenter is John Johnston, KE5MHV, Director of Emergency Management for the ARRL. The Amateur Radio Emergency Service consists of licensed amateurs who have volunteered their qualifications and equipment with their local ARIES leadership for communications duties in the public service when disaster strikes. Come learn about opportunities to volunteer and train and to hear stories about best practices, the importance of building mutually beneficial relationships with local emergency management services, and the importance of our partnerships with served agencies. Sponsored by the American Radio Relay League, the National Association for Amateur Radio. A complete list of Hamvention forums can be found at www.hamvention.org. Jose Castillo, N4BAA of Strawn, Indiana, has been named the new CQ Worked All Zones Award Manager, effective immediately. That's announced by CQ Magazine editor Rich Mosen, W2VU. Castillo succeeds John Bergman, KC5LK, who's retired after managing the Worked All Zones program since 2014. Licensed since 1977 at age 13, Initially as WD4LAH, Jose has been a very active DXer for more than 44 years. He's a past president of the Virginia DX Century Club and has also been a member of the North Florida DX Association, Potomac Valley Radio Club, Yankee Clipper Contest Club, and Frankfurt Radio Club. He currently belongs to the Society of Midwest Contesters. Castillo is on the DXCC Honor Roll, holding the CW Mixed and Phone categories. It also holds the five band work to all zones with 200 zones. In addition, Jose holds 37 of the 38 possible work to all zones awards. He's still working on 80 meter RTTY, possibly the only person with this distinction. He's also attained five band DXCC with endorsements for 12, 17, and 30 meters, and has over 150 countries on six meters. In addition, he has 2,959 banned entities in the DXCC Challenge. Professionally, John is an Operational Excellence Director for Train Technologies. He holds a BS and an MBA degree in Project Management from Granham University. He spent 23 years in the U.S. Navy, retiring in 2007 as an Electronics Chief Petty Officer. I'm sincerely grateful to CQ Magazine and Rich for giving me the opportunity to give back to the DX community says N4BAA. The CQ Worked All Zones Award has always been my driving passion, and I look forward to continuing the notoriety and success. Worked All Zones is the second oldest continuously operating award program in all of amateur radio, dating back to the 30s. Only the International Amateur Radio Union's Worked All Continents Award is older. Another update for you now about a United States amateur that was charged earlier this year with using the airwaves for criminal activity, is back in the news yet again this week with new charges filed against him. You may remember the story of Richard Wagner, the Erie, Pennsylvania radio amateur charged with making bomb threats and bogus weather reports over the air late last year and earlier this year, now faces new charges of again using the airwaves for criminal purposes. According to a report in the Erie Times newspaper, Detectives in Erie County filed charges on Tuesday, March 29th, saying the radio amateur used emergency frequencies in late March to make threats against witnesses, victims, and a judge who had presided over his earlier criminal cases. Richard Wagner's call sign is listed as N3BWG on QRZ.com. Meanwhile, all but two of the 37 criminal charges in those earlier cases had been dropped on March 3rd, and the bond money holding him in prison was substantially reduced. In the latest development, detectives claim that Wagner made the new threatening transmissions over frequencies used by the County Emergency Management Office and the Pennsylvania Emergency Management Agency. He was once again arrested and placed in Erie County Prison on $175,000 bond and now faces charges of bomb threats and retaliation against a prosecutor or judicial official. 
April 18th will be a day of pileups and celebration for hams around the world, marking World Amateur Radio Day. In Denmark, hams are activating the call sign 5P0WARD. They are also making special awards available for contacts with stations having different suffix extensions. This year's global celebration also marks the return of the Tentec Legacy Nets, which will be posting operating schedules on their groups.io page. A clean sweep endorsement is available for check-ins on all three bands. Meanwhile, the South African Radio League will be issuing a commemorative certificate to radio amateurs who make QSOs on April 18th and submit a log sheet. In India, more than 65 new license holders are expected at a VHF-UHF disaster operations workshop co-hosted by the West Bengal Radio Club and the Indian Academy of Communication and Disaster Management. Attendees will build antennas and use them afterwards in a fox hunt. Also, don't forget the World Amateur Radio Day Voice over IP Echolink Net. Using the call sign W2W, the 16-hour global net starts at 9 a.m. U.S. Eastern Daylight Time on April 18th on the ROC-HAM Echolink Conference Node 531091. Again, Echolink Conference Node 531091. A special QSL card will be available to hams who send a stamped self-addressed envelope. Details are available at www.roc-ham.net. Again, www.roc-ham.net. Following questions from members, Sweden's National Amateur Radio Society, the SSA, has issued a clarification regarding annual fees for amateurs running more than 200 watts. Amateur Radio in Sweden was made license exempt on October 1, 2004, and 1000 watts could be used. But on November the 1st, 2018, Sweden's communications regulator, the PTS, reduced the license-exempt amateur radio power limit from 1 kilowatt to just 200 watts. A special permit and an annual fee is now required for the higher power level that amateurs had previously been allowed. In early April this year, the SSA said that several amateurs had been in contact with questions about invoices for permit fees from the Swedish Post and Telecom Agency. If amateurs are aware that they've been granted a high power permit for 1000 watts, then the invoice received is most likely to refer to this. The permit is automatically extended by five years at a time, as long as the radio amateur does not cancel it. But the fee must still be paid annually. For 2022, the fee is 323 Swedish kroner, that's equivalent to about £26, which includes a market control fee of 11 kroner. Sweden's National Amateur Radio Society says that therefore this is not an attempt to reintroduce a general license fee for operation using less than 200 watts. More information is available on the regulator's website, www.pts.se. The Radio Amateurs of Canada are notifying Canadian amateurs that due to the ongoing global pandemic, it's caused significant disruptions in the international supply chain, and this in turn has increased the cost of living and of doing business in Canada. Even before the pandemic, RAC already faced increases in the production and mailing costs associated with the Canadian Amateur Magazine, but now the cost of everything is up. Each spring, RAC's programs and services usually switch into high gear. This year is no different, as they're currently planning World Amateur Radio Day in April, participation in Canada-wide Science Fair in May, Field Day in June, and the Radio Amateurs of Canada Challenge throughout the year. Behind the scenes, their dedicated volunteers are also working on several regulatory initiatives, as described by the Regulatory Affairs Office of Dave Goodwin, VE3KG, in the Regulatory Roundup column, and in the DARF Annual Report of 2021, in which their International Affairs Officer, Sergei Bartuzo, VA3SB, describes the important role that the volunteer representatives are able to play at the World Radio Communication Conference, thanks to generous donations of amateurs concerned about the erosion of the spectrum. Effective July 1st, the fee for digital membership will increase by 4%, from $48 a year to $50 a year, and the cost of paper TCA membership will increase by 10%, from $56 a year to 62 The RAC went on to say that they don't take this step lightly, and they thank all of you for your understanding and continued support. It is time to pass the torch for the CQ Magazine DX Marathon and its longtime manager, John K9EL, 
is looking for a successor. Could it be you? John has been at the helm of the contest since its creation in 2005 and is hoping to find someone who can infuse the competition with a fresh look and new tools to encourage this pursuit of DX. In a special statement on the DX Marathon website, he wrote that the marathon has reached a turning point and many of the processes that have supported it all these years need to migrate away from being handled manually. He wrote, in summary, the DX Marathon needs a fresh look, some updated tools, and some serious work on evaluating and submitted logs. This is John's final year managing the marathon. The search is on for an individual or group to carry this popular contest forward. For additional details, visit dxmarathon.com. On April 9, 2019, Finland's communications regulator, Traficom, added the use of encryption to the amateur radio license in that country. A translation of the post by the Finnish Transport and Communications Agency says, A radio amateur license may be issued to a legal person engaged in radio amateur communications whose controller of the radio amateur station holds the certificate of competence required for the task. The requirement that the purpose of the legal person should be to carry out radio amateur communications has been removed from the order. The supervisor of a radio amateur station requiring a special permit shall hold a certificate of competence of a general class or technical class. The amendment does not apply to the supervisor of a radio amateur station whose name has been notified to FICORA or the Finnish Transport and Communications Agency, Traficom, before the entry into force of this regulation. Radio amateur communications are not usually allowed to be concealed. However, two forms of radio amateur communication have been added to the order, which are allowed to be encrypted, and the renewed order allows encryption in the case of the proportion of the message that ensures the integrity of the sender and messages, control communication between the command earth station and the satellite for radio amateur activities, and the control communications of a radio amateur station for which a special license for a radio amateur station as referred to in Section 5 is required for the possession and operation of a radio amateur station. The revised amateur radio rules and regulations for Finland are available online. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. You got Leo right now. Your personal tech guy. I don't know what you do with those old computers. You know, uh, you can donate them. There are charities uh, like, uh, what was it, the Christina Foundation that will take old computers, recondition them. Uh, usually they'll, you know, wipe the drive, put Linux or something free on there and uh, give it to uh, charitable organizations that need computing power. You know, computers, uh, they, especially, you know, the computer you're buying today with no moving parts, you know, the hard drives will wear out, but, the, but nowadays with SSDs, they're not going to wear out for a lot longer than the software will be useful for. This is the problem. You know, uh, the computers, we got, the computers we're buying today, they are very, very powerful. They'll go for a good 10, 15 years without becoming obsolete, but the software gets obsolete, right? So I love the idea of reconditioning, bringing back an old computer to life by putting a modern operating system on it. And I'm not talking Windows and I'm not talking Mac. I'm talking an open source, free operating system like Linux. The reason is, uh, and Ubuntu is, is, a, is the easiest one to use, especially if you're coming from Windows, it'll be very, very familiar. There, there are, by the way, hundreds of flavors of Linux and for all different kinds of users. You know, there's very geeky Linuxes and there's Linux for novice. Ubuntu is a great kind of choice for anybody who's not used it before. Very easy to use. You install software from a store, just like as you would with Windows or Mac. With a click of the mouse, it's very straightforward. I think, frankly, the days of uh, proprietary commercial software are fading. Believe it or not, maybe for specialized stuff like video editing or photo editing, but for the most part, how are you going to make a word processor better? And the free and open source version of Office, for instance, is as good as Office. How are you going to make Office better? How is Microsoft going to justify that 10 or 15 bucks a month they're charging for Office 365? It's not going to get that much better. It's been done everything you need to do for years, hasn't it? 
has it? I mean, what <laughs> what feature is missing? So it, it, uh, open source software has really kind of caught up, in other words. It's kind of what they're, and admittedly, they're building on the foundation that the co private companies like Microsoft and Apple have created, copying in many cases what Microsoft Office can do. But at this point, there's a lot to be said, and, and you don't have to, for you, by using free open source software, not only free as in it costs nothing, more importantly, free as in liberty, as in free as in no commercial entity can spy on you, no government can spy on you. Uh, it's your, it's yours. You own it. And as companies like Microsoft and Apple and Google and Facebook get more and more in the mindset that we own you, you, we don't work for you. You work for us. You're the product. We're, you know, then really that's how they're thinking, isn't it? When Microsoft puts a big blue window up on your desktop saying, sorry to interrupt, <laughs> but you really ought to upgrade to Windows 10. Covering everything you're doing, covering the everything you're doing, forcing you, even if you're in the middle of something really important, to pay attention to their ad, that's the time to turn your back on them, I, I say. And, and uh, start using software that works for you, not software you, that em employs you. <laughs> I just think that's wrong. So go, by all means, if you haven't used it before, go try it. It's easy to try uh, Ubuntu. You go to ubuntu.com, uh, download it. You can put it on a USB stick or a CD or a DVD. You can actually try before you buy it. You don't have to install it. You just boot to that USB stick or you boot to the CD. Start up your computer by booting not to your internal hard drive but to that external device, and you'll be able to use it completely. I mean, it's a little slow because it's running off a USB stick, but it's there, and you can see how it works. You can see if you like it. You can try a lot of different versions of Linux that way. Pick one you like. If you're a Mac user and you want something that feels and looks like Mac, there's Elementary OS that is designed to be a Macish Linux experience. Free open source, free as in money, but f but more importantly, free as in liberty. And I think that's that's where computing is going, to be honest. Uh, let's see. What else can we talk about? It's so hard sometimes to remember how things used to be. We're like a fish in the water. We don't really we're not, we're surrounded by it, but we don't really we're not really aware of the water. We're not we're we're not well equipped to notice how things have changed. Occasionally, you know, old timers like me will say, "I remember when you had to go into the bank to get money. You had to go in the door, and there were people inside." I remember when you had a little machine hooked up to your telephone line and it had a paper, a little crinkly up paper would spit out documents. I remember when you had to call people to talk to them. And now we just, you know, well, I'll tell you what, when's the last time you made a phone call? I know a lot of us still make phone calls, but I think that's starting to die out too, right? We don't, we don't even think about the phone aspect of a smartphone as much as we're now talking about the camera. Camera's number one, right? The screen, the games you can play. Well, that's another thing that's changed. We cannot stand. I notice this now with myself and with everybody around me. We cannot stand to sit idle for even one second. You're in an elevator, you pull out your phone. You're in a grocery line, you pull out your phone. People don't just look around anymore. <laughs> Or talk to each other, they, they they pull out their their little amusement device. The register calls uh, smartphones fondle slabs. <laughs> the register's a British uh, tech publication. They have the kind of British attitudes all to all this. But the idea is, it's a slab of glass. They're all basically the same, right? That you fondle. I was noticing the other day. So I'm I'm standing there, and I and I what was I doing? I can't remember. Oh, I was, I know what I was. I was on a, uh, on a light rail train on the way to the football game, to the 49ers game. And it's a crowded train and it's a, you know, 20 minute trip, uh, on the light rail. And I'm looking around, a lot of young people all have their phone out and I'm kind of being a, my stubborn old man guy. I didn't pull my phone out. I'm not going to look at it. I'm going to look around. I'm going to talk to people. Nobody wants to talk to you. They're looking at their phone. Okay, I'm not going to talk to people. I'm just going to look around. Man, it's boring in here. 
But then I pulled out my I did. I, 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 I could do it about three minutes. <laughs> and, then I, and then I pulled out my phone. And there, it's not like there's compelling content on there. I almost, I look at it and I go, well, I did, oh, I already looked at Instagram. I guess I could look at my Facebook feed. Nothing new there. Anything going on on Twitter? Well, there's always something new there, but none of it makes any sense. <laughs> so you're kind of still staring off into space, aren't you? You have different stimuli, but it's not like you're learning something. <laughs> Maybe you are. Maybe maybe you're. Maybe you don't. Maybe you use use your uh, time to good. You you have an iTunes U college lecture all queued up that you can listen to at two minute increments. Is it just me? I'm nervous about pulling my phone out of my pocket at the gas station. We've heard that. I don't know how true this is, but that static sparks can be generated from pulling your phone out of your pocket. You're not supposed to use your cell phone while you're pumping gas. Did you know that? I don't think anybody knows that. I think there's people, I see people who smoke cigarettes. Well, <laughs> that is definitely not supposed to happen. At least, at least uh, with uh, your fondle slab, you're not going to blow the gas station up. Or are you? I hope you're not. Anyway, keep it in your pocket. Of course, anytime there's a bunch of people and mostly young people doing that, then there's a whole bunch of people, mostly people my age, going, you kids, pay smell the air stop and smell the roses look around you see what's going on life is happening and you're missing it i don't know is it are you missing it you're missing the stuff that's immediately around you but at the same time you have a portal a window into a whole different world just because it's digital doesn't mean it doesn't exist in some form or fashion i think the stuff that you do and see and play on the internet i mean i don't know is that any more or less a waste of time than looking around and seeing what's out the window i have to say when i was sitting in that light rail train i felt like i was wasting my time not using my fondle slab probably shouldn't say that in public not using my smartphone <laughs> i feel like looking out the window well that's nice looking at people they start to think why is he looking around at me what's he what's he doing why isn't he looking at his phone are you a creep why aren't you why aren't you looking? I did. I felt like a weirdo not looking at my phone when everybody else is. It's like being in the library and everybody's quiet and looking at their books and you're looking around. It just doesn't work. Anyway, I just, uh, just a thought. You know, I think we are moving towards a more balanced. I hope we're moving towards a more balanced approach to this where we recognize that it's not the end all and be all to have the smartphone and stare at it all the time, that there is other stuff going around, but at the same time, not rejecting it. We need balance, right? These things are useful. You've got a supercomputer in your pocket that's always connected to the internet. You can, you can, you know, in the 15 minutes that you're standing in the line of DMV, you could, you can find out what's going on around the world. That's pretty cool. Anyway, I'm glad you were here, and I'm here, and I'll be here next week, and I hope you'll come by and bring your friends, too, as we talk high-tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here on This Week in Amateur Radio. Among railroad enthusiasts, they are known as fallen flags, rail companies that have disappeared from the American scene. Some, such as the New York, Ontario, and Western Railway, were completely abandoned, their rails torn up and the right-of-way slowly returning to nature. Others, such as the Erie, the New York Central, the Pennsylvania Railroad, and, most recently, Conrail, disappeared in the black hole of corporate mergers, their infrastructure living on under another name. Amateur radio also has its fallen flags. Radio companies that once dominated the RF landscape of our hobby, but now are gone. Some went bankrupt, their assets sold and their factories torn down to make way for urban renewal. Others, facing the harsh competitive realities in a small amateur market, abandon ham radio and turn to other, more profitable communication activities. In the next few installments, we will look at our fallen flags, starting with the National Radio Company. National began life in 1914 as, believe it or not, a toy company. 
From 1914 through the early 1920s, the National Toy Company made a healthy profit on toys and household goods. During World War I, National made airplane parts and thread gauges. In 1922, National reached a crossroad. The broadcast business was booming, and there was a severe shortage of quality radio components needed to build receivers. The largest manufacturer of variable capacitors at that time was Cardwell. Note that name, we'll be seeing it again. The demand for capacitors far exceeded Cardwell's ability to supply, and National, always seeking new profitable markets, began manufacturing variable capacitors. In 1924, National was approached by two Harvard engineers, Glenn Browning and Fred Drake. They wanted National to manufacture their Browning Drake tuner, which was a vast improvement over other broadcast band tuners then on the market. National agreed, and the tuner became so popular that the company decided to drop all of its non-radio products, change its name, and concentrate on radio receivers and components. They began looking for someone to guide the company exclusively into the radio market and, in 1927, hired a young man named James Millen as chief engineer and general manager. In 1928, National introduced the SW-2, followed in the 1930s by the SW-3, SW-4, and SW-5. The SW stood for shortwave, and the number indicated how many tubes the unit had. These were high-quality regenerative receivers, very popular with shortwave listeners and amateurs. Production on this series lasted 20 years until 1948. Other early receivers from National, designed exclusively for the broadcast market, included the MB-29, introduced in 1929, and the MB-30 in 1930. Both of these units were tuned radio frequency receivers with several stages of RF application. In 1935, National introduced the receiver that would carry it through the next 30 years, the HRO. This radio had a crystal filter, two RF stages, and a dial mechanism that was so accurate the receiver could be set within one kilocycle of the desired frequency. The 1930s also witnessed National's venture into the UHF spectrum with the model 1-10. This was a super regenerative receiver that covered 27 megacycles all the way up to 300 megacycles. World War II brought a massive increase in National's business. Employment swelled from 250 to over 2,500 as the company fulfilled its government contracts. In the post-war market, National held its own. The HRO receiver was still growing strong and was joined by various other receivers, the NC-100, the NC-200, and the NC-300. For the beginning shortwave listener, or novice amateur, National introduced the affordable NC-60, which covered the broadcast and shortwave bands from 550 kilocycles to 30 megacycles. I remember using this radio 30 years ago in my novice days. National also had some transmitters and transceivers, but their market share wasn't as strong as Collins, Heathkit, Halicrafters, or E.F. Johnson. In 1964, the HRO finally reached the end of its production life. Also that year, the National Radio Company sold its capacitor division. The purchaser? The Cardwell Condenser Corporation, National's old nemesis from the 1920s. In 1965, National introduced its last classic, the HRO 500. This was a fully synthesized, transistorized receiver that covered 5 kilohertz through 30 megahertz in 60 separate 500 kilohertz segments. It was an outstanding receiver for use by the military, government agencies, or amateurs willing to pay top dollar for the very best. By the late 1960s, the Japanese were jumping into the U.S. amateur market with low-cost units. High-end companies such as National simply couldn't compete. 
Throughout the early 70s, National gradually faded from the amateur market and concentrated on government contracts. In the early 1970s, the National Radio Company went through bankruptcy. After reorganization, they emerged from bankruptcy and continued to supply the government with various radio products, including the HRO 500. Time was not on their side, however, and in 1991, the National Radio Company filed bankruptcy for the second and last time. The remaining assets of this once proud company were put on the auction block. And yes, in case you're wondering, the purchaser was the Cardwell Condenser Corporation. In our next installment, we will look at a company that was formed by one of National's former employees, as well as a famous amateur radio manufacturer whose name started with H. Which of the three possible companies am I talking about? So, until then, check out the internet auction sites for any HRO or SW3 receiver. They're a great investment. I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY. Marconi Day is another favorite among amateur operators because it honors our shared history, no matter where our location is on Earth. Connections to Guglielmo Marconi are everywhere, in Italy, the UK, the Falkland Islands, Germany, Austria, and the United States. Those locations and more will be lighting up the amateur radio map on April 23rd, the Saturday closest to Marconi's birthday, as stations get on the air for International Marconi Day. These are official stations who have registered with the annual events organizer, the Cornish Radio Amateur Club, GX4CRC. They'll be using the call sign GB4IMD during the 24-hour event. Marconi's actual birthday was the 25th of April in 1874. Hams are being encouraged to make contact with these historic sites, which have connections with the radio pioneer. Registered stations will only be active from sites where Marconi had operated from, lived, or set up an experimental station. Listen for them around the band. According to the BBC, prototype software for the world's biggest radio telescope will be coded by a group of universities and labs in the UK, with money just released by the UK Government Science and Technology Facilities Council. The software for the Square Kilometer Array, or SKA, will direct the telescope's gaze at the sky, translate its signals into data, and diagnose issues. BBC News reported that on Monday, the 11th of April, the Council released £15 million, the equivalent of more than £19.5 million in US currency, for the work that will involve teams at Oxford, Cambridge, and Manchester universities, as well as those at the Science and Technology Facilities Council's own labs in Edinburgh, Darisbury, and Harwell. The Square Kilometer Array consists of an array of 197 dishes and 130,000 antennas in both Australia and South Africa. The software will allow astronomers to interpret what is received by the Square Kilometer Array at an intensely high resolution. The array is one of the most sensitive radio signal receiving devices on the planet. This is November 3, Victor Echo Mike from Parks on the Air with your month ending March 2022 Parks on the Air update. Be sure to visit parksontheair.com for information about the program and poda.app for spotting, park information, leaderboards, and more. In Parks on the Air news, we hope you'll join us in just a few days for the spring Support Your Parks event on April 16th and 17th UTC. If the past is any indication, there could be anywhere from six to 800 operators putting parks on the air for the weekend event. This is a great opportunity to get out portable and activate some parks as the weather turns warm, or to just stay at home and have plenty of parks to chase. It's also an excellent opportunity to practice and prepare for the summer's big event, our annual plaque event. This year that happens on July 16th and 17th UTC. All of our plaques, including the three new DX Activator plaques, are now fully sponsored thanks to a number of generous hams. More information about the summer event will be coming over the next couple of months, so stay tuned to these monthly POTA updates and the plaque event section of POTA.app. And now for our monthly stats update. March's warming weather brought out quite a few more operators than the prior month. We had approximately 1,700 operators out as compared to February's approximately 1,500. These 1,700 hams did more than 9,000 activations from over 3,600 parks in 31 different DX entities. The top activators for the month were N2 NWK, who did 289 activations, and W6ZD, who activated 100 different parks. 
The top hunter for the month was someone that anyone who has ever picked up a QST magazine should recognize, none other than K1RO, who earned the honor by hunting 1,745 parks while making 2,372 QSOs. In Poda DX, we continued to see some very interesting shakeups. By region, the busiest countries are the familiar three of England in Region 1, Canada in Region 2, and Japan in Region 3. Japan once again managed to just squeeze ahead of Canada as the top DX entity, with 322 activations, compared to Canada's 308. We had a new upset in the top DX activations category this month, with the most activations going to a station in Region 1, M0OVG, who did 52 different activations. The most DX parks activated went to a now familiar call sign, JF7RJM, who finished out just slightly ahead of VA7DBJ with 25 parks activated. Last but not least, let's check in on the progress of the Bailey Sprott Challenge. In 2021, N5HA and W9AV each managed to hunt a park every day, so in 2022 we're following along to see if anyone else can match their feet. At 94 days into the year, we have five activators who have activated every day of the year, N2NWK, KE8PZN, KD4MZM, KB3WAV, and WC1N. The pool of hunters has now dipped to just 40, including yours truly, still in the mix. To all of the Bailey Sprout participants, congrats on your success so far, and we look forward to seeing how you do as we head past the 100-day mark. This concludes our March 2022 Parks on the Air update. As always, the team at Parks on the Air wishes you safe activations and happy hunting. 73. Foundations of Amateur Radio One of the first questions a new amateur asks is, which radio should I buy? It's a topic I've discussed at length, and the answer, it depends, is unhelpful without doing more research. But after you've done the work, you'll be able to answer it for yourself. A question that is just as important, but not asked nearly enough, frankly I've not heard it in the decade I've been part of this community, is how should I build my shack? The answer is just as useful. It depends. So, let's explore what precisely your shack design depends on. Let me start with pointing out that I'm not here to give you answers. You can watch hundreds of YouTube videos, read a gazillion web pages, and get no closer than discover how others have answered this question. It wasn't until recently that I understood that it was a question at all, but airing my frustration at the level of dysfunction of my shack unearthed it, and in attempting to answer my own question, I started to explore the landscape. As with choosing a first radio, one of the very first answers you need for yourself about the ideal shack is, what do you want to use it for? That in and of itself is not enough. I had an answer for that. I want to operate my weekly net, I want to do casual HF contesting, have a beacon running, and have space for experimentation. It wasn't until Ben, Victor Kilo 6 November Charlie Bravo, suggested that I dedicate a single radio to the weekly net and the contesting, and use the other for experimentation, that I discovered that this wasn't going to work for me. I want to be able to use both my radios at the same time, in a so-called single operator to radio setup, or SO2R. This will allow me to extend the boundaries of my comfort zone, and in doing so will give me plenty of new things to learn. So the question, what do you want to use your shack for, is probably the single most important thing you need to discover. If you're like me, the obvious answer is, everything. But reality soon sets in and you might start to create an actual list of things that you want to do. Prompted by Ben's suggestion, I was able to articulate for the very first time something that I didn't want to do. I didn't want to set a radio aside for experimentation. So, when you're considering what you want to achieve, also think about what you don't want. For example, I have no interest in using the 6 meter band at this time. Not because it's a bad band, far from it, it's because I'm not permitted to use it with my current license. Same for the 23 centimeter band. This means that I don't have to find ways of making my shack accommodate those two bands. My current license permits me access to precisely 6 bands, and the station I'm building only needs to access those bands at the moment. That brings me to the next question for the ideal shack design. How long do you expect the layout to last? For example, are you going to build a new building for your shack for the next 50 years, or is it something that's going to last for the weekend? Is your shack going to be moved, or is it something a little more permanent? Are you going to change your needs, and should you incorporate some of that into your design? Or are you perfectly happy with what you're doing today? You have to remember, this is your shack, not mine, not your friend's, yours. 
it means that it needs to accommodate what you want. The next question, boring as it might be, how much money are you going to spend? Building a whole new shack out of the catalogue is perfectly fine, but you might discover that the gear you have today is ample to get your shack started. You might leave space for a different piece of kit, or you might decide that the shack needs changing when a new shiny piece of equipment arrives in a nondescript brown box. Some other things to consider are what operating actually looks like. I've seen shack videos that look like a tour through a radio museum with more radios than I have keys on my keyboard, sometimes all connected, other times just stored on shelves to look at. Are you going to have more than one radio operating at the same time? And if so, how are you planning to control them? How many antennas are connected to this shack, and how do you track which antenna is connected to which radio? What are you going to do about power? Does everything run on mains power, or are you going to build a 13.8 volt supply for all your gear? Where are you planning to put computer screens? What about keyboard, mouse, Morse key, and antenna switching controls? In other words, what do the ergonomics of your shack look like? Remember, there is no right answer. The answer you come up with is yours and yours alone. Look at things that work for you, and take note of things that make you wince when you see it in another shack somewhere. That's not to say you should be dismissive, rather use the opportunity to ask the shack owner why they made that choice. Who knows, it might cover something you hadn't considered yet. So, what does your ideal shack look like? I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. ARRL is seeking candidates for job opportunities at its headquarters in Newington, Connecticut. Available positions include Director of Information Technology, Public Relations and Outreach Manager, Social Media Strategist, and others. ARRL Human Resources Manager Lucy Goodwin explained that some of the jobs are brand new positions established to help advance the association's ongoing digital transformation across membership programs services and publishing. Some of the positions are responsible for increasing awareness and growth of amateur radio, said Goodwin. A new program area will expand ARRL's visibility in promoting ham radio to the public and through their outreach to like-minded communities. A list of open positions, including the responsibilities and qualifications for each job, is posted at www.arrl.org careers. Employment opportunities are available for candidates with or without an amateur radio license. We're always on the lookout for experienced radio amateurs who want to contribute their passion for ham radio to the ARRL headquarters team, added Goodwin. To apply, submit your resume to ARRL Human Resources. If you like contesting, there is a lot ahead in radio sport this month. On April 15th, the Holy Land DX contest, that will be for CW phone and digital. On April 16th, the Worked All Provinces of China contest, CW and phone there. And the Michigan QSO party, that will be on April 16th, CW and phone. And on the 17th, it's the Quebec QSO party. And on April 19th, the 222 megahertz spring sprint, that will be CW, phone, and digital. There are some upcoming section, state, and division conventions this month. April 16th shows the ARL Roanoke Division Convention, that's the Raleigh Ham Fest in Raleigh, North Carolina. On April 23rd, the ARRL Delaware State Convention, the Elmara Amateur Radio and Electronics Expo, that's all in Georgetown, Delaware. May 1st, the ARRL Eastern Pennsylvania Convention. That's the Warmester Amateur Radio Club and Ham Fest. That's in Bristol, Pennsylvania. And on May 7th, the ARRL Indiana State Convention. That's in North Central Indiana, the North Central Indiana Ham Fest. And that is in Peru, Indiana. It's time for the weekly propagation forecast report, brought to us each week by Tad Cook, K7RA in Seattle, Washington who tells us that at 2335 UTC on April 14th, the Australian Space Forecast Center issued this geomagnetic disturbance warning. Increased geomagnetic activity expected due to coronal hole high-speed wind stream from April 16th through the 17th, 2022. So as we come to air on Saturday, April 16th, we are in the middle of a solar storm. Let's take a look now at how solar activity fared over the last seven days or so. Sunspot numbers and solar flux declined this reporting week, April 7th through the 13th, although solar activity wasn't really down. Instead, we saw solar flares and coronal mass ejections every day, 
causing disruptions to HF radio communication. There was a new sunspot appearance on April 7th and another on each day from April 11th through the 14th, yet average daily sunspot numbers declined from 94.6 to 34.4 and the average daily solar flux from 135.3 to 103.1. The average daily planetary A and dice increased from 14.4 to 15.9 during the period, and the average middle latitude A and dice measured at a single magnetometer in Virginia went from 10.9 last week to 12.6 this week. The latest solar flux prediction from the United States Air Force Space Weather Squadron via the NOAA shows modest activity for the next month with flux values of 105, 110 on April 15th and 16th, 115 on April 17th to the 20th, 118 on the 21st, 110 on April 22nd through the 23rd, and 115 on April 24th, 118 on April 25th through the 28th, and 116 on April 29th through May 6th. Looking at the predicted planetary A and dice now, it will be 15, 10, 12, and 10 on April 16th through the 19th, 5 on April 20th through the 22nd, then 15, 10, and 8 on April 23rd to the 25th, 5 on April 26th through the 28th, then 18, 12, and 8 on April 29th through May 1st. It'll be 5 on May 2nd, and then 8, 15, and 12 on May 6th through the 8th. The 2022 Amstat President's Club coins have arrived. Those coins commemorate the 50th anniversary of Amstat's launch on October 15, 1972. This year's coin features an image of Amstat Oscar 6. You can join the Amstat President's Club today and help keep amateur radio in space. Knox, Tennessee Today reports that radio amateur Tim Berry, Whiskey Bravo 4 Golf Bravo India, is determined to restore his magnificent 140-foot radio tower that was damaged by storms. Their story says that Tim Berry loves radio, so much that he bought and maintained a 140-foot tower in Blount County that was used by emergency services as well as ham radio operators all over the region. And Tim Berry's tower doesn't just help hobbyists, it saves lives. But a howling 80 mile per hour wind that raked the mountain on the last day of March toppled the tower and stopped the work for now. And WB4GBI is determined to replace it with the help of a group of friends who are just as determined as he is to ensure that this situation is just an interruption, not the end. Tim and friends have started a GoFundMe campaign to help him rebuild the tower. One friend said that, initially licensed in 1973, Tim was one of the most humble men you would ever meet in amateur radio. He lives and breathes radio in any form, whether it's in his job as a broadcast engineer or as his hobby. He graciously gives back to the entire East Tennessee community as a labour of love, often keeping him away from family and friends, while maintaining and servicing 19 repeaters for the East Tennessee ham radio and general mobile radio service communities. Tim Berry's family founded and operates a prosperous South Knoxville funeral home business, but instead of following in the footsteps of his father and grandfather at the home, Tim Berry was just a little kid when he decided to make radio his life. He said that he got interested in radio when he was seven or eight years old and got his first ham radio license when he was 13. He got his engineer's license when he was 18. You can read more on this at www.noxtntoday.com and there's a link to the GoFundMe campaign there too. One of the challenges many amateur radio clubs face is finding a constant flow of presenters to keep meetings interesting. John Portoon, W6NBC, a former electronics industry writer and educator, as well as a frequent contributor to QST and other related publications, is offering a partial solution. Portoon has developed a series of presentations on a variety of topics and has made himself available to present them. Portoon said he was looking for something to do now that he's retired, so he decided that volunteering to teach on a variety of ham topics fit right in with his skill set. Portoon gave a presentation to the Porter County Amateur Radio Club in Indiana on Friday, April 8th. His topic was the design and construction of a 10-meter Moxon antenna. His presentation is available on the internet. He can be reached through his website, w6nbc.com. 
Des Walsh, Echo India 5 Charlie Delta, has reported that for the last month he's been receiving strange pulse-like signals with a repetition rate of four per second, sounding like a ticking clock. They are spread evenly across 25.8 MHz to 26.1 MHz in the 11 meter broadcast band. Remarkably, these transmissions have very sharp fall-off at the signal edges. With a 10 kHz change, these pulses disappear. Des says he cannot even guess what the purpose of these signals are. No audible changes have been noted, just the usual fading at such frequencies. These signals are heard locally in Cork area and can be heard on the 20 SDR in the Netherlands, so they're not local to Des's location in the Republic of Ireland. Des wonders whether anyone can guess what the purpose of these 4 per second pulses are, being transmitted across a 300 kHz bandwidth continually. Signal levels are not strong. Being in the 25 MHz region, daytime propagation means that there's little chance of interference from other signals. It's a mystery, says EI5CD. Youngsters on the Air has announced this year's International Amateur Radio Union Region 1 Youth on the Air Summer Camp will take place August 6th through the 13th in Croatia. After the pandemic forced the cancellation of the Youth on the Air Summer Camp for two years running in IARU Region 1, organizers are back on track. The camp is accepting attendee applications for this year's camp, which will be held in August in Croatia, in Karlovac, just outside of Zagreb. The host for the 10th edition of the camp is HRS, the Croatian National Amateur Radio Association. Youth coordinators throughout Region 1 are being asked to identify as many as four participants from their member society and submit the youngsters' applications no later than May 8th. Each team will consist of a team leader between the ages of 18 and 30 and a small group of team members aged 15 to 25. Team leaders may be chosen from attendees of previous Youth on the Air camps, but team members must be first-time attendees. No more than 80 may attend. The dates for the camp again are August 6th through the 13th, 2022. For additional details about costs and schedules, visit the Youngsters on the Air website at ham-yoda.com. And now, with his segment on tower climbing and antenna safety, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. Every year in the spring, folks in the Midwest experience a phenomena I call dead band. The good news is it only lasts for about eight weeks and is gone most every night. Maybe this one has bitten you. Here's what it is. Dead band season is generally, it starts in mid-April and ends in mid-June. Almost every day about 9 o'clock a.m. until about 45 minutes after sunset we experience very poor band conditions. Power line noise is unusually bad and propagation on most bands is far below average from AM broadcast to cellular and paging above 1 gigahertz, everything is below average. While weather may seem to be a factor, this occurs sometimes without regard to the weather. Days with clear skies, low humidity and high winds are usually the worst. I notice it the most in my truck on those days when I get half scale S meter noise readings on 6 meters, 2 meters and 220 from power lines stronger than at any other time of the year. An AM radio station I like to listen to about 45 miles from my home is usually full quieting, is barely hearable during dead band season. My cell phone is functioning well below average during the day and simplex conversations on 220 can take 35 watts to cover only a few miles. What's even weirder than dead band is how it can affect certain regions and leave others untouched. Sometimes I think altitude of the ground may be a factor too. In the early morning hours we can hear tropo skip from 150 miles away, but locally conditions on VHF and UHF are very poor at best. Everybody experiences dead band, but few people talk about trying to identify its cause, then maybe a cure. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. Des Walsh, Echo India 5 Charlie Delta, has reported that for the last month he's been receiving strange pulse-like signals with a repetition rate of 4 per second, sounding like a ticking clock. They are spread evenly across 25.8 MHz to 26.1 MHz in the 11 meter broadcast band. Remarkably, these transmissions have very sharp fall-off at the signal edges. With a 10 kHz change, these pulses disappear. 
Des says he cannot even guess what the purpose of these signals are. No audible changes have been noted, just the usual fading at such frequencies. These signals are heard locally in Cork area and can be heard on the 20 SDR in the Netherlands, so they're not local to Des's location in the Republic of Ireland. Des wonders whether anyone can guess what the purpose of these four per second pulses are, being transmitted across a 300 kilohertz bandwidth continually. Signal levels are not strong. Being in the 25 megahertz region, daytime propagation means that there's little chance of interference from other signals. It's a mystery, says EI5CD. The Youth on the Air camp for young amateurs in North, Central and South America is on the move. While campers prepare for this summer's adventures just north of Cincinnati, Ohio, organizers are looking for a host site for next year's regional camp and are opening a bidding process for the location for the 2023 camp assignment. The week-long camp is open to licensed amateur radio operators between the ages of 15 and 25. Potential hosts should be able to schedule the camp between June 1 and August 15th of 2023 and have access to meeting rooms, event space, and lodging that can accommodate 25 to 40 youngsters and 10 to 15 staff members for six to seven days. Outdoor spaces will be needed for some events. The camp also requires space for at least three HF stations and antennas to be on the air simultaneously. More details and a host application form are available in an information packet at youthontheair.org. If you have questions or are interested in applying to host, contact Assistant Director Adam Johnson, KD9KIS, at adam at youthontheair.org no later than June 30th, 2022. The 2022 Commonwealth Games starts on the 28th of July. Over 5,000 athletes will converge on Birmingham and the surrounding area in England from an estimated 72 hosts to compete over 12 days as part of the Games. The Radio Society of Great Britain is organising a number of activities to support the event, including a special event station in the grounds of the National Exhibition Centre. The Society wants to showcase amateur radio to the athletes and the public for as much of the games as possible and will need a large number of volunteers to operate the station and to chat to visitors. Due to the location of the ham radio station, operators will only be able to access the games by train and participants will be security checked as part of the accreditation process. If you'd like to help operate the station during the Games, contact the RSGB Region 5 representative Neil York, Mike Zero, November Kilo Echo, by email to rr5 at rsgb.org.uk. That's Romeo Romeo 5 at rsgb.org.uk. Following the Russian aggression against Ukraine, the European Space Agency Director General has initiated a comprehensive review of all activities currently undertaken in cooperation with Russia and Ukraine. The ESA Council, on April 13th, acknowledged the following findings and took the following decisions. ESA will discontinue cooperative activities with Russia on Luna 25, 26, and 27. As with ExoMars, the Russian aggression against Ukraine and the resulting sanctions put in place represent a fundamental change of circumstances and make it impossible for ESA to implement the planned lunar cooperation. However, ESA's science and technology for these missions remains of vital importance. A second flight opportunity has already been secured on board a NASA-led commercial lunar payload services mission for the Prospect Lunar Drill and Volatile Analysis Package, originally planned for Luna 27. An alternative flight opportunity to test the ESA navigation camera, known as Pilot D, originally planned for Luna 25, is already being procured from a commercial service provider. Meanwhile, a way forward for the pilot precision landing and hazard avoidance technology is already being defined. This capability is needed for European lunar exploration activities, such as the European Large Logistic Lander, EL3, proposed for decision at CM22. Further, the ESA Director General and the President of the Japanese Agency, JAXA, last week signed an agreement to fly ESA's EMSL, the Exospheric Mass Spectrometer Instrument, on board the JAXA ISRO Lupex Lunar Rover Mission. This adds to the growing list of European experiments flying to the Moon in the next few years. Although all the elements of the ExoMars Rover Mission, the Launcher, Carry Module, Descent Module, and Rosalind Franklin Rover have now passed their flight readiness reviews, 
because cooperation with Roscosmos on ExoMars has been suspended, the mission will not be launched in September this year. Instead, a fast-track study is now underway, led by Thales Alenia Space of Italy to assess options for the way forward. World Amateur Radio Day is April 18th and is celebrated worldwide by radio amateurs and their national associations, which are organized as member societies of the International Amateur Radio Union. With more on this special day for amateur radio, we go to Steve Ford, WB8IMY, reporting from League Headquarters in Newington. It was on this day in 1925 that the IARU was formed in Paris. American Radio Relay League co-founder Hiram Percy Maxim was its first president. Bob Inderbitson, NQ1R, ARRL Director of Public Relations and Innovation, said, quote, On World Amateur Radio Day, all radio amateurs are invited to take to the airwaves to enjoy our global friendship with other amateurs and to promote our skills and capabilities to the public. Use the backdrop of World Amateur Radio Day to describe and demonstrate ham radio to family, friends, and co-workers." Close quote. While World Amateur Radio Day falls on a Monday this year, Inderbitzen encourages amateurs and radio clubs to extend the celebration to include the weekend or even all week. For more information and resources to participate in and promote World Amateur Radio Day, get online and go to www dot a r r l dot o r g forward slash world dash amateur dash radio dash day some radio clubs will even seek a proclamation from their town or state government designating the period to recognize the contributions of radio amateurs to our communities and the overall importance of our amateur radio service he said ARRL reports that there are more than 775,000 hams currently in the U.S. ARRL also supports a nationwide network of 2,400 affiliated radio clubs. Radio clubs provide opportunities for newcomers to discover radio and to become ham radio operators, said Inderbitzen. Clubs develop the personal radio communications capability of their members operating together or from their home stations, in portable settings, and from nearly anywhere. Inderbitzen also highlighted that among the primary purposes of the amateur radio service, one of the most important is to enhance international goodwill. Radio amateurs use radio signals, which reach beyond borders, to bring people together culturally while providing essential communication in service to their communities. The theme of World Amateur Radio Day this year is celebrating amateur radio's contribution to society, and this is especially relevant given the important role amateur radio will play as the current global crisis unfolds. The IARU will list all World Amateur Radio Day activities on its webpage. To have your World Amateur Radio Day activity listed, please send an email to IARU Secretary Joel Harrison, W5ZN. April 18th is the day for all of amateur radio to celebrate and tell the world about the science we can help teach, the community service we can provide, and the fun we have. More information and resources for participating in and promoting World Amateur Radio Day can be found on the ARRL webpage or the International Amateur Radio Union page at www.iaru.org stroke on dash the dash air stroke world dash amateur dash radio dash day. Use the ARRL special event stations listing to find on air events by entering World Amateur Radio Day in the keyword search. On social media, use the hashtags World Amateur Radio Day and ham radio. We hope you will join in the fun and education that is World Amateur Radio Day. In their response to the European Commission Solar Energy Strategy, the International Amateur Radio Union highlighted the level of radio frequency pollution that can be caused by the solar photovoltaic optimizers used in solar panel installations.
A post on the IARU Region 1 site says that their Political Relations Committee, in conjunction with the region's EMC Committee, has submitted a paper to a recent European Commission call for evidence with respect to solar energy strategy. Solar energy systems, which include solar PV, are a progressive technology, the use of which is to be encouraged. However, there are certain caveats to be noted in deployment and ongoing use. IARU concerns are not with solar technology per se, but with the potential pollution from so-called optimizers. The paper that was submitted detailed elements of the ongoing research and monitoring by the EMC committee in this area. In the report, the IARU said that the situation regarding solar PV optimizers is particularly problematic. While, from an efficiency perspective, optimizer use is promoted and encouraged, optimizer high-frequency switching harmonics can contribute significantly to radio spectrum interference and pollution, while giving a fairly marginal efficiency improvement of the order of 2%. Indeed, in a research paper published by the University of Southern Denmark on the impact of optimizers for PV modules, the author concluded that the common marketing claims of additional energy production by applying optimizers could not be confirmed by their experiments. In fact, there were only very few scenarios where the use of optimizers improved the system performance. The report also pointed out that optimizers are often retrofitted to solar PV systems, and the resulting combination of apparatus and cabling acting as an antenna can lead to the unintended radiation of high-frequency harmonics. You can read more in the IARU Region 1 paper at www.iaru-r1.org. And finally this week, the Spratly Islands in the South China Sea have long been on Ham Radio DXers' most wanted lists, and getting there to operate has always been dangerous because of competing claims to the islands by various countries. Now, the Associated Press reports that China has fully militarized at least three of the islands in the region, quoting a top U.S. military commander as saying the islands have been equipped with anti-ship and anti-aircraft missile systems, fighter jets, and laser and jamming equipment. According to the U.S. Indo-Pacific Commander Adam John C. Aquilino, this is part of what he describes as China's largest military buildup since World War II. The expeditions to the area are strongly discouraged. Many of the news and information items heard on this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the AWRL Audio News Service, and the AWRL Letter, the Southgate Amateur News Service, Steve Richards, G4 Hotel Papa Echo, and the Southgate Vibes News Service. AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the FCC, the Radio Society of Great Britain, and Ofcom. The South African Radio League, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia, and the Australian Communications and Media Authority. The New Zealand Association of Radio Transmitters, the Amateur Radio Newsline, the Rain Hamcast, Eric Guth, 4Z1UG and QSO Today, QRZ.com, The Tech Guy, Leo Laporte, the International Telecommunications Union, and various news sources on the internet. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard around the world on nets and great repeater systems like our newest affiliates, the K2IWR repeater on 147.180 MHz in Cortland, New York, and the K2MST repeater on 443.150 MHz serving all of Syracuse, New York. We welcome them aboard the vast This Week in Amateur Radio network of repeaters and nets around the world. If your net or repeater carries This Week in Amateur Radio, why not let us know about it and we'll give you a free promo here on the air. All you need to do is put all the details into an email and give us the repeater call sign, frequency, area served, and the days and times that you carry this week in amateur radio, and send it off in an email to w2xbs77 at gmail.com. We'd be happy to hear from you. That address, once again, is w2xbs77 at gmail.com. We hope to hear from you real soon. With special thanks to all our weekly news sources and to you, our listeners, that wraps up this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. If you'd like to write to us, you can find everything you need, including archive editions of the news service, at our website 
at TWIAR.net. And now, for all of us at This Week in Amateur Radio Headquarters and our news team around the world, this is Chris Perrine, KB2FAA.